How important do you think it is to have a metric um, if you're uh, working in a space that doesn't have one, but it helped you a lot, uh, particularly in terms of computational efficiency, if you did have one? Um, and uh, uh, can you think of the, the ways that you might impose a metric on your space uh, uh, if you You already have a metric. How important is it to your, uh, uh, I mean, if you couldn't impose a metric on, on the, uh, especially working on, uh, would that severely impact your, uh, uh, the ability of the uh, algorithm to optimize? Okay, I think that goes to the heart of the notion that we tried to suggest, which is that um, there is significance to the metric, and we do have to start with something. I think there's always going to be um, some kind of fundamental hard nut uh, at the bottom of AGI, you know, other people may disagree, where you've got to start from something. And I think what I tried to show is that if you start with a very elementary base metric, then you can discover a lot of additional layered structure on that metric in the course of some process that uh, is quasi-cognitive. And uh, you can actually discover that with very limited knowledge. Um, one of the questions that occurred to me, uh, uh, to Matthew, is that it's a clear to me, probably at the heart of what you're doing, is how do you decide uh, what to transfer from? But right, you said that's what your paper was about. In, in the work that I presented, um, I'm definitely interested in trying other base metrics and hybrid metrics. Um, but I do, at least for the results that we got, if you, if you didn't have some kind of starting point, then you really wouldn't have a fabric to learn from. And there's a suggestion there that you kind of need some, some springboard to get you going in some direction. And if you try to make it uh, altogether general, then you're just not going to learn a great deal. I think also uh, what, what Brian suggested is it's a lot of theme that goes through a lot of projects is that you need to introduce the outset some kind of um, initial tendencies or, or initial uh, known structure beforehand. Yeah, I think in something uh, as broad as general knowledge, it's hard to believe you're going to have a natural metric for everything. Uh, it's hard for me to believe. And you can impose metrics on, say, probability distributions. So if you don't know what's the right distribution for how the world behaves, um, you could impose a metric on the different distributions, um, but and, and you can imagine a certain class of, of inference algorithms that would exploit that. Um, none of the inference algorithms that I put up uh, on my side actually do rely on having a, a metric particularly, except in the sense of uh, MCMC processes, so Markov Chain Monte Carlo inference procedures. Um, where you're moving from possibility to possibility in some space. And so you're not, you're in some sense imposing a neighborhood structure on your space of possibilities because your MCMC is visiting things in a certain way, um, but it's not necessarily a neighborhood based on a metric. Matthew, have you noticed any difference in uh, the efficacy of transfer learning? Cases where you can impose a metric on, say, whatever heuristic it is you're trying to transfer, and then one through the Well, if I, if I understand what you mean by my metric, um, we don't have a real good idea for, for, for what that is in terms of transfer. So ideally, you would have some kind of, of distance metric between different Markov decision processes. And when, when that metric is minimized, then you know that transfer learning is a good idea. When it's really high, you don't. Uh, but right now, we're mostly relying on human intuition to figure out what the distance is, or what the metric, uh, how similar different tasks are. Not only like you could use the interactive search organization, however. Uh, any, any comments from the AIXI tender with Spectrum? Oh, I don't uh, have some space of aspects and I don't need to look at this between various states, but I guess analog of metrics for me would be the length of the description from a lower complexity uh, of the data. And this is something that minimizes essentially. So one can uh, 
use it in all work complex as a matrix in principle. But uh, so I, I no, I don't think about it okay. as matrix as distance scale and triangle inequality. Okay. Well, let's see who is the who is the red line. A question for Brian. Um, your system's going to be uh, trolling the internet, gathering information. Um, in many knowledge representation systems, um, the ability to track the context from which the information came is often left as a problem to be bolted on later. Um, I uh, wonder whether you consider, for example, um, are you getting information from you know, a biased website, or are you trying to learn about Taiwan by reading information from people in Taiwan or people in Beijing? Um, do you happen to just be you're, you're trolling an internet site on Lord of the Rings history and does the thing, you know that? Um, is, is tracking the provenance of the information just another prior to throw into the Bayesian thing, or is it important enough to uh, kind of keep that very much in the surface? Right, so, um, I mean, of course, this is far from implementation, but I think that would be something that you'd have to do early on in an implementation of this, um, especially because there's so much on the web that's context-specific. It's about fantasy worlds. It's about people's different interpretations of the way the world works. Um, so, actually, the way I think of handling linguistic input is to think about, uh, okay, this linguistic input has some connection to the real world. It's not a veridical just readout of what the world is like. It's some person or entity saying these things or writing them. And you have to think about uh, the connection that goes through that entity's mind between what they know or have seen or think and the words they're saying. And so I think that has to be a, a central part of the system. So, uh, the, the model that I drew there sort of has an undefined set of variables. Um, in simple cases, so let's start with the, the case of, uh, you know, I just am trying to interpret a video and I don't know how many people or vehicles or whether there are vehicles there at all or that kind of thing. And so, whether I include variables for vehicle positions depends on whether I think there are vehicles there at all. And we're now getting an idea of how to define probabilistic models at a level of distributions over structures with varying numbers of objects in them. And then the number of, of sort of attribute value variables that you need to describe one of those structures is going to depend on how many objects it has in it. Um, and I think the, the idea is to scale that up to saying, well, we have even more uncertainty. We don't even know what kinds of objects there are. We don't even know that there are things called vehicles. Um, so you're going to have higher levels of uncertainty about um, even what your, your probability model is. Um, and, and that can recursively be done in terms of a, a prior over models. Um, so it's, it's sort of recursive layering of uncertainty about what variables you're going to need at different levels. Um, pretty, I mean, obviously it's not implemented, but that's the general idea. Um, this is also for Ryan, but it's more general, so maybe other people want to answer two afterwards. Um, the idea of doing a top-down decomposition on uh, different facets of reality is very appealing, but um, let's say you have a sentence um, like, I am rubber, you are glue. So, and you have uh, one, a very well, a nice probabilistic model of social relationships and another model for um, physical things like rubber and glue. And uh, do you see the, that kind of etymological mapping Um, I and mean, I think you know, the system is self-contained, so it would have to be internal to it. And it's an excellent question how you integrate, say, social reasoning and physical reasoning um, about you know why you'd say somebody's rubber or glue or whatever. Um, uh, I mean, we had some hints this morning about how to combine physical reasoning with a more general reasoning system. Um, I don't think I, at this point, have much to add. I um, in, in general, I'm sort of pushing for there to be a special mechanism for it because it seems to me that it, it's almost an n-squared problem if you have n separate domains, you can have n-squared mappings between the domains. And it seems like it's something that you can do very naturally. Right. Well, I guess I'm thinking of the domains as all sort of being grounded in the same 
physical reality. So, um, I mean, you have objects in the world. I think it's about everything organized around objects. Um, some of them are going to be physical objects, and those are going to be associated with shapes, um, positions in space, extents in time. Um, and then some of those same things, you know, a person is a physical object. So that, that same person object is going to have associated with it knowledge and beliefs and goals and who their friends are and, and all that. So I'm thinking of it all being tied through some general logic-y uh, object representation. Thanks. Anybody else wants to? Um, my name is Noam Shazir. I have a question for Sergey. Um, the question is that you're doing uh, this Markov chain of Monte Carlo um, around the walk over <coughs> Um, the configurations of, uh, of this current machine. Are you limiting that random walk to configurations that match the uh, observed uh, sequence of outputs so far? Uh, yes, so this was the whole point earlier. Because I start from the configurations which respond to the final state of the Turing machine, meaning I have the desired output, right? And uh, then uh, every configuration I have in this uh, market chain walk uh, corresponds to some Turing machine computation leading to this final state. So, yes, every uh, configuration is the program which uh, gives the desired output and this roughest So, my follow up is that how do you know that this that space of configurations will be connected? Uh, well, uh, because of every configura any two configurations, if they can be connected by two machine computation, they are connected by the uh, proposal function Q. So it's an equality problem. Yeah. But the, they're all they're connected by configurations that map the, that also match the uh, that match the observations. Yes. Uh, see, I uh, are all by the two machine computation. Basically, if there is a such computation which leads to the output, it means uh, that my uh, monitor, my uh, market walk can go back to. So. Oh, so you, you go back, back and then sort of search, uh, go and search forward for another computation? I, 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 yeah, I mean, I do not go beyond the final state. So uh, it's basically limited to going past the time. But of course, it can go back and forth, but never goes beyond the final state. We can discuss details uh, later. It's, I mean, I, I'm not saying all, all the details, but the idea is like this. Questions for Matthew. Uh, how well does your general framework map to partially observable NTPs? Extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, keep away that the uh, soccer simulation that I showed is actually a partially observable domain. Um, but we treat it like an MDP, just ignoring the partially observable part. And for, for tasks where they're not too uh, unobservable, you, you can get away with this trick. Um, if we wanted to actually you know, tackle full-on POM DPs with, which, uh, with very limited perceptions, then we probably have to do something. We haven't tried that yet. My guess is that we'd be able to do something similar, but that's future work. So we've, we've looked at doing transfer with model-free and model-based methods. So um, in, uh, for the soccer example, we've used uh, SARSA and Q-learning. We've used a policy search algorithm called NEAT. And uh, our recent work on, on learning, uh, learning a model in continuous state variable domains hasn't yet been scaled up to that, but we're hoping to. Do you have a more specific question, or is was that generally what you're asking? Yeah, about? Yeah. Any other 
questions? Yes, hello. Um, I'm Scott Livingston from the University of Tennessee, and my question is directed both at Brian and Matthew. Um, it seems a problem in learning or knowledge development is the integration of different senses or different media of sensing. In the case of Brian, it's that different media on the internet, text, information, the video information being integrated. Uh, so a dog in text and a dog in video coming into the same knowledge uh, representation. And uh, for transfer learning, or task, a uh, task transfer, Matthew, it seems that a challenge would be translating a state space is defined according to one particular sense medium uh, to a different task in which the, a different sensor is used. Do you have any comments on that, any work you've done in that regard? Um, so this is a, a really hard problem in general. Um, and there's been some work on grounded language learning, uh, not by me, but um, other people who are trying to learn to connect words to parts of the physical world. Um, and I think that's actually something that's going to have to be, to some extent, built in. When I put that thing in there about linguistic reasoning being uh, something built in, I think the, the general idea that um, people, when they use language, are, are referring to things in the world, um, at least a lot, um, it seems like you would never get off the ground if you didn't give it that to start with. Um, so uh, people might have other ideas about that. Um, but yeah, I would say that the general principle of people tending to talk about things in the world uh, would be built in and then based on correlations between, say, videos and what people are saying in the audio corresponding to it, or videos and uh, descriptions that come with them, plot summaries, whatever. Uh, you would learn particular correspondences between words and physical objects. For reinforcement learning, for transfer in RL, that's uh, one of the hard questions. Uh, one of the advantages we have in reinforcement learning is that the agents are grounded, um, in that they can observe the world, they can take actions, look at how those actions affect the world. So for instance, last year we had an ICML paper which did cross-domain transfer. So we had an agent learn a simple board game, and one of the things it learned is that when I get close to the opponent, that's bad. And then we use that to transfer into keep away. So it, and then we as humans could say that the distance between two board pieces is somewhat analogous to two players playing soccer. If the bad guys get too close to me, I'm going to lose the ball. Um, so if, if there's a human in the loop to make those, that kind of analogical reasoning, then using our system, we can just kind of drop it in. Learning those kinds of relationships autonomously is more difficult. Uh, we've made some progress towards that, which I could talk to you more about offline, but that's generally a, hard, a harder task. Okay, uh, question. Of course. My question is directed to Bill. In fact, I think their resources are directly linked with performance in the application, and there is a fact that when one wins, the other one loses <coughs> some resources. But cannot we imagine some, some environment where resources are, are only partly shared, and for example, we, we go to something like the red green effect in biology, where both of them just observe the other and can improve their performance for comparison? Yes, uh, in my software experiments, I actually modeled a situation in which there was uh, an increasing total amount of, of resources. I mean, there was nothing fancy about it. It was just a uh, sort of a compound interest growth in performance. And, uh, it, you know, the, the, ins, uh, the unstable computational resources race sort of depended on the balance between the overall growth and other factors. So I mean, you could have the overall growth swamp the race so that you know both neither side ever lost completely, and it all depended on just how you tuned it. Yeah, there's a general trend in um, uh, uh, evolutionary game theory, um, and I don't know if there's a theorem to the effect or not, but uh, the general trend seems to be that if you have a if you have a zero sum game. Um, the cooperation cannot evolve in that uh, environment. And, and so the evolution of cooperation and ultimately that it's acceptable uh, requires uh, non-zero sum interactions. So um, I'd like to start with kind of a general methodological comment, which is that there's a big gap between saying, I want to make significant progress on AGI, and I'm going to 
to solve the whole thing. So, so my comment is for both uh, Brian and uh, Sergey, and, and that's a, they're sort of, and it's one thing to say that by uh, using multimodal internet data, we're going to make significant progress in AGI. It's another thing entirely to say using that trans, not transfer, using that learning method, and in that domain, we're going to go the whole way. It's the same way with uh, AC, which is actually a, um, a rather different sort of case, but. Uh, if you look at AC, it does have certain assumptions built into it. It assumes, for example, that the environment is separable in the sense that there's nothing you can possibly do that will screw up, up its chances at, a, at getting rewards forever. It, it, so it, it, it's built into AC the assumption that it cannot drop an anvil on its own head. Nothing you can do to can kill itself. And that's actually part of a complex of problems with AC where it assumes that it's separated by a hard barrier from its own environment. It doesn't have to worry about expanding onto new hardware or creating copies of itself. It gets a reward signal that's assumed to be the correct reward. It does not actually have a general utility function over the consequences of its actions. It just has a reward signal. Um, so, and since we do not actually want an AI to go out and grab control of its own reward button and uh, without having any other utility function than that, um, it, 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 it may not be suitable for AGI on that ground, but even apart from the ground where what the drops an animal on its own head. So, there's really two sort of separate uh, uh, comments over here, but, but, in, but in both cases, I, I want to point out that there, it's a very strong claim to say this is it, this is the whole problem, and not just this is a step along the way. I'm not saying this is the solution, but uh, uh, I don't understand why you cannot uh, possibly consider any problem of religious uh, as the problem of an agent uh, maximizing its reward. Right? It's, it's just not the problem, and I think uh, I'll be able to say how to formulate in terms of uh, agent maximizing the reward. And uh, reward, I assume, will be given by, uh, by, by humans, right? Because the uh, AGI. Humans. So it doesn't have, doesn't invent uh, utility function like all reward is is given, and it's, and so it's external. Well, that's a perfectly fine assumption if you're dealing with narrow AIs or even sort of weak AGIs. But if you're dealing with strong AGIs that can model the whole world outside them and potentially grab their own reward button from their controller, at that point you start wanting to give them utilities over things in the world. And not assume that the humans have strict control of the reward button and that humans themselves cannot be persuaded, hacked into, and modified. Um, you, don't, you don't want to assume that it's your formalism at the point where you're dealing with full scale AGI. Well, there are many means of control. It's not going to explode in a second, but in some kind of uh, singularity that, in my mind, yeah. It's really up to human to provide this control, and I think there are plenty of means to control. Just a quick comment. Some people have worked on um, intrinsic rewards in reinforcement learning. So, uh, for instance, Sitinder Singh, Andy Barto, looking at things like novelty. When you turn on the light the first time, hey, that's cool. And then let's see how this button works. Oh, okay, I get it now. Now I don't get a reward signal anymore. So there are there are some formulations where you can have internal as well as externally defined rewards. I guess just to answer the other part of the question, um, certainly there's there's stuff missing from this thing that I talked about, and maybe saying AGI through da 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 da, da was um, not the right thing to say because of course it, it, I didn't talk anything about action selection, for example. Um, and so I'm looking at only sort of half the agent problem of figuring out what's out there and how the world works. Um, so, yes, certainly, a lot more to do. I just had a brief uh, comment on, on the paper on uh, approximations to AIXI, which is, it, it seems to me that there's an awful lot of approaches to AGI that could be interpreted that way. For example, the Novamente system, although we don't generally think about it that way, in fact, if you looked at just the 
automated program learning component of, of, of Nova Menta and don't worry about scaling very much. I mean, that, that ultimately, if you throw enough resources at it, can do general program induction and therefore can do what AIXI TL does. In other words, g given enough resources, we can learn any program using the, the Moses program learning component of, of <coughs> Nova Menta. It's, we never think about that way because it's just not very useful. So it seems like you can make that argument about an awful lot of different AGI approaches. I mentioned Nova Mente just because I know it better. So almost any really powerful AGI approach that can be considered seriously probably would approximate AIXI or Girdle Machine or whatever you want when you throw enough resources at it. I'm, I'm not sure what makes your approach special then. I think it's really question not to have uh, as much resources as possible, but uh, trying to uh, do the computation in uh, as optimal way uh, as possible. So, and uh, okay, there are approximations which are uh, optimal in a synthetic way, but as you mentioned, we have this huge constant, and uh, practically it's not feasible. Uh, my approach, uh, I don't think it's an optimal, but I hope. Uh, I may get rid of this huge constant and uh, I, I'm trying to make it optimal. As I pointed, uh, the way of, uh, first of all, some of the trajectories which are already uh, presumed to be as likely trajectories is the way uh, to basically to uh, significantly reduce the amount of computation. Uh, so, it's not really the issue of having as many, as much resources as possible. Sorry. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. sorry. I just thought, uh, you know, Ben, in your talk yesterday, you said one of the things that gave you uh, optimism was the development of these uh, theoretical bases for uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And one of the nice things about Sergey's approximation is that it's simple enough that you still might be able, it's still sort of theoretically tractable. In other words, you could take his approximation and do a theoretical analysis on it. And the question is, if you regard Nova Menti as an approximation to AXI, is it amenable to that sort of theory, theoretical analysis? Perhaps it is, but it's... Well, you can theoretically analyze it, but I'm not sure the most interesting questions can be resolved by that theoretical yeah. analysis. Well, you know? right. I, well, we're taking as a given your slide yesterday that said that that was... Interesting. <laughs> I think, I mean, so, you know, my, my background originally, I have a PhD in math. Yeah, yeah. I, I think right. this stuff is interesting yeah. just as, as a mathematician. Right. And I, I love the paper you gave because it kind of brings, brings the, the mathematical theory a little bit closer to practice. But I guess there's, to my mind, there's a number of steps left to be taken. Oh, yeah. Part Actually. of it has to do with what the notion of inductive bias that Eric Baum has talked about so much in his book, what, what, what is thought, where, where you think about an architecture like Nova Mente or Lida or NARS or any of the other architectures at play, have so many implicit assumptions about the structure of the world that the AI system is going to act in. And those assumptions are kind of implicitly packed into all different aspects of the architecture and the design of the learning mechanisms. And what, what these assumptions about the world built into the architecture do is they, they give the system a, a bit of a, a head start in kind of doing reinforcement learning, program learning, based on the particular environments, virtual or real, that the agents are going to have to act in. And an algorithm like, like the one we saw approximating AIXI doesn't have all these assumptions about the world packed into it. So it's going to have a lot more work to do just to learn learn all those inductive biases from experience, or else we built them into the architectures. And the, how you bridge that gap in a theoretical sense, the problem is you somehow have to formalize what are the assumptions about the world, about space and time and agentness and so on that we're building into our architectures. I don't know how to formalize that stuff. Um, sure, I mean, I mean, a huge one, you know, taking a, a, what, what Hey Wang is trying to teach us is, you know, these models are infinite, you know, whereas the world is finite. So, I mean, there's a big, you know, but of course, theory is so much easier when you're dealing with infinite. Yes, I think uh, you may need to build in some initial uh, simple uh, models, which will, 
it's possible so to come by in interactive uh, biases, biases, which will be a good start to it. But uh, in a sense, it uh, doesn't inv invalidate the theory, right? Because uh, you can say you simply choose a uh, better Turing machine to begin with, which will uh, will reduce your constant. Uh, another thing I wanted to say. No, it doesn't. It doesn't invalidate the theory. I guess the question is, can you formalize the relevant biases about the real world in a tractable way so as to be able to actually feed them into the theory? Because what we're doing now, as AGI system designers, we're informally embodying our intuitive knowledge of the bias about the world in our AGI designs, rather than kind of formalizing all those biases and feeding them in in some formal logic format. Well, you'll give a best to it as you're going to teach the system anyway, right? So the question. If you'll give us information in the very beginning of your teaching, or and some kind of work on part of human, I think is needed either by building it, it in the start, or by teaching it. Right, but let me take a, a very almost trivial example. In, in our knowledge repository in Novamente, we chose to make special indices to index knowledge by space and by time. And that's a very, very simple example, but we put some time into designing a space and time server for indexing knowledge. And you, you don't have to do that. We could have just used a general logic representation to index things by space and time. We did that because we know, well, space and time are, are really important. Now, if, if a system has to learn through experience that it wants to build an index for space and an index for time, that's going to take it a really long time. It's, it's got to like learn that space and time are important abstractions to make. And that it's not that you can't do that. It's that it this will increase the amount of time it takes to learn by a large amount, which is then packed into some large constant in the learning theory, right? I, I, I agree. I don't expose what uh, this may be really a way to, to proceed. Uh, but again, for me, important that okay, having this amount of knowledge will be optimal way to build the new knowledge incrementally. But initially, I, I totally agree with it such a space-time representation will be convenient. But if, if we had like a crisp mathematical formalization of the inductive bias that we bring in interpreting the world, then you could probably feed that into a theory like yours and do everything in a very elegant, abstract way. We just don't have that formalization. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, <laughs> I think we have time for just one more question, Sam. Uh, it, it's interesting that you know, this discussion really is rotating around the, the concept of innateness in AGI. Right. You know, what's what's built in? What what has to be learned? And and it's something that we don't address directly in a lot of our papers and, and thoughts and architectures. Uh, I think that's maybe something as we continue this effort at this conference that we ought to address directly as a community. Is what do we think is is a, a you know a minimum innateness or the advantage of building in say an index for space and time versus not, or and, and address it directly as a community. Because we can go back and forth about saying, well, I did it this way, I did it that way, and, you know, all day long. But if we're going to build an AGI, it's going to have some sort of baked in something, even if it's just first order predicate capitalists. You know, so we have to, we have to go with, uh, with the way of defining that to move forward. So, any thoughts from the panelists? What should we make? It seems to me that um, this business of where we start with, like you mentioned, is, is fundamental. And um, I don't know about other people, but I get the feeling that it's really a little bit bigger than already to tackle. Uh, all the dimensions that uh, Brian mentioned that we have to consider as possible variables in terms of what model to construct to begin with. Um, and so I suggested, one, one of the things that I suggested is that maybe if for some people this is too modest, but it might produce a result a little bit faster, is that we turn the, uh, the experiments we try to do on, on its head, and instead of trying to tackle it bottom up and say, well, what do we have to construct to capture the whole world, um, let's relate to the fact that we know human beings do these sort of things without thinking very hard. And um, instead of having them as ghosts in the back of our models, in the back of our papers, that there's always some place where the human being is dropping in some model or some bias and we just kind of gloss over that, let's instead take a cognitive process that we explicitly recognize as a human one and try to uh, explicitly replace a component of it and participate in it. 
I'll just try to get one example of that today. And I just suggested that maybe we could learn more by relating head on to the fact that we're learning from the human kind of process. And that we start with some very, very basic uh, metric that we define on it. We try to make it as minimal as possible. And we try to see what additional structure can be learned. And that way, we might actually learn more than keep trying to eat the whole cake at once. Try to construct all the possible variables and possible dimensions that we need to start with in the AGI system. OK, well, that's uh, the end of our time. So.